blessed sabbatical lights to all. As we always say, blessed love and light. Um, it, biblically speaking and also physically speaking and spiritually speaking. See? The only way you are going to know if you are serve the true and live in God and you depend on the right wave is when you hold the Sabbath. You have to hold the sabbatical lights. That's the only idea. The proofs are the real Almighty God creator. Now I mean, well, we don't know, say, to our own set it, we don't know if you hold the other. You know, because them says a day where you know if you work. Well, remember, say, the energy in a, in a man's body never stop working. If the energy stop working, you're dead. So, moderation to that. As we say, we don't take no talk from Babylon, we seek the truth to ourselves. So, to our brother and our sister, them, they're right, you know. It is, it is true. It's true, it is. Well, it's sabbatical order, but no pressure yourself. Like you feel like, say, you know, if you eat on Saturday and, you know, but why really, I say, the most I create the earth in a seven day and you rest on the seven. Saying, rest on the seven don't mean saying, no, do nothing, because I'm have to meditate. You understand? I'm have to regenerate, I'm have to, I'm have to charge up like himself with the universe and with the Almighty God. You know? If you deal with them are people are hurt, because you say I be a bad people. And I hear yeah, them you and, and I know the people must say them are bad people, you know. You see me a long time bad people are hurt, man. Cause remember say we first have the powers. Just like the powers of the Almighty have, you know. Apart from the powers, you know, if you tell you the truth, the, 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 the real powers of the Almighty have, are we in bless are we in blessed with it, you know? Cause remember say Jacob, you know, Jacob create Adam, you know. You see? So you know, so enough powers we miss out pan. Most of have to take back certain gifts from we because we are going to use, we are going to self-destruct. We will self-destruct because we are not following no order. And for you not follow the order, the Almighty Father, you are going to self-destruct, brethren. You see, me can make out in his own image, his own likeness, his own kind. See? So if you want to see our worship, the true and living creator, when you hold the Sabbath, that's a significant order for you say yes. A the real creator, that. And within this time, we don't use name, because the name them try to confuse you with the, with the name them. So Frank, you say the Almighty Father, the Almighty Mother, the Almighty God, the Almighty Goddess. They go me and say, Mother, it's so beautiful and modest. So blessed sabbatical lights to all. And I rise with that with with energy this morning, a thing name. Blessed, you know, singer, a thing name, how to recreate yourself. And, and you know what I mean? So we share the mighty because we have to recreate ourselves. We have to get rid of the poison of Babylon, poison us mentally. You see me? Physically, spiritually. Yeah, if you be a better person, if you have a better role, we have to recreate ourselves. You know what I say? We have to, we have to re educate ourselves. You see me? We have to, we have to humble ourselves. We have to go back to the laws of nature, the laws of the universe, which is the only laws that is legal. All laws of mankind are illegal because it is made to control. And the Almighty God create everything and everyone with a free will. See? Remember, say, even, even though we are leaning to the other, our Babylon teach with their medication, we even violate the laws of, of birds, beasts, and animals, too. You understand? Animals were made with one free will for living for them own a place. And people go catch some of them and cage them. Give thanks to the ones them where, where um, can adapt a pet and give them a better life. But meanwhile, giving them a better life, you have to rich, respect their boundaries too. Respect their free will. More time you have to carry them, go let go them back in the wild. Make them connect back with them family and connect back with the universe and feed them own away. You dig what me I say? Some moderation to knowledge. You dig what I say? I say more light to your light. More governance to your covenants. You understand know what me I say? Hey, and me want to tell you, say, me is a youth, me different, you know. Me is a real African, or the African order me all, you know. And they go me and say, stem through the, 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 the Rastafari spirituality and order. You see, but we reach on a different level, you know. My, my thing, you know, me have to really govern myself and know, say, me is a hierophant. You see me? Hierophant means, say, me study about Buddha, me study about everything. Me study about Allah, me study every religion. Because in every religion, there is a stem of truth. So me pick from everything if you come to the fullness. You dig what me and say, so I am a elephant, true African. That's what me de. You see me I say stem from the Rasta man. You dig what me I say? Cause we can't stay upon one level, you know. Cause you have to self-destruct. Remember the law, you know. Say anything where you conquer. 
if you stay, they say I go serve this truck. So some man does stop a Rastafari, they may go serve this truck. The worst, they may live the liberty. People are going to do things that they're not supposed to do. So, you know, it's seven Emmanuel. It's seven heaven trod. You understand me? I say, you man, you can't tra travel on the astral level. They go, me, I say, you can't go in at the second and the third and the fourth dimension. This, from the fifth to the sixth, I want the angel them high enough can travel. That's all. They go, me, I say, so bless up you real bubble them where I hold it. Bless up all the Rasta man where I hold it because it's very challenging in Babylon. You see me, I say, because if you look outside on yourself, you're not going to self destruct. You know, if you just look within. Rasta man on the wake up. Empower on yourself, you hear? People them need you know. They go me and say, people them need you know, Bridgen. Chant, Bridgen. Write a book, Bridgen. Put, take up your phone, Bridgen. Rasta, don't get weak. Don't get weak. Please don't get weary. The children of the earth need you. You dig what me and say? Eh, eh. And they must say free royal boss, them for free Jack Yor too. Free Jack Yor. You see me, no man is perfect. You dig what me and say, because they never teach us the laws of the universe. You see me and say? So, right now, a mercy. Goodness and mercy, we are big. For the real kings, them were behind bars. The ones them we know, one them we don't know. You dig what me and say? But behind bars, they're not behind bars. It's supposed to be a university, it's supposed to be a college. For one know themselves. If you forward back in our aeration with a positive light. Because every day we were out here, we in a this in a the free will world. We don't have much time to sit and study. Or to focus. So where them there now is the university them there. So what them can focus the right way. Cause them have to see the light again. And they go me and say so when them forward them know say, yeah. Everything a two things in our life, you know, is a lesson and a blessing. Bless up in our queen. Yeah, man, more heights to your crown. Rastafari is the closest to the truth. Rastafari is the closest to the realms of the Almighty. Rastafari is the only, only liberty. We establish Rastafari, we establish the African spirituality that balance all nations. Every man where you see the born in Africa was created in Africa. Every nation. You see, man, a Rasta come, come open the seven seal so the people them can know the truth. So empower yourself, Rasta man. Don't get weak out. You dig what me I say? Don't get weak out. You see me I say, take full responsibility for your, for responsibility for your actions. But guess what? Know your purpose. You dig what me I say? Forward back to the heights. You dig what me I say? Don't get weak out. Please. You see me? Yeah. Blessed love and light. Bad skull. Bless up yourself, brother. You see me big up on no badness, you know, because uh, people must, must wonder why you hear the Jamaican youth them say badness. Uh, because they know that they are bad slaves, you know. And they have to say something to, 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 to match the, the system that go going around them. They have to strengthen up themselves and say strengthen up the badness so that uh, Babylon know them can't two step and walk upon them. Big up all of the bad slaves, them worldwide. Big up on no badness, but here what? You know, if you go know, they know say, you know, have to big up on no badness more than the badness. You see me, because to me, when them say badness, is a defense. So Babylon knows that they want to walk upon. They can't trample them upon them. You see me, I say, but me, Lord, I don't big up on no badness. You know, if you lift up on no godness, here. Yeah. Because godness come with gladness. You see me, I say, badness come with madness. You know, know that. You see me, time and place see everything. You dig what me, I say? Yeah. So bless up everyone. Every youth out there, you shall know the truth. You see what me, I say? When I follow Ras Murdoch, follow me because I have a great plan. You see, I have a great insight to guide the youth. Because the, the most I call upon youth because we are strong. They go, I say, youth. Because the way them youth are powerful, them affi find a character. A man without reputation it is nothing. So when you hear them say, hey, big up my badness, a bowl in my bowl, he strength in my game. He make you when he step on the road, he feel mighty in himself. So them youth, them respect and welcome them youth there. Because we are going to teach them and show them the height so they know if they stand up. In our heart. You see me? Better you be something than be nothing. Stand for something than stand for nothing. You dig what I say? Yeah, man. So we go to all our people in worldwide, man. You see me? So the, the, the height, so you hold upon the Sabbath day is recreate yourself. You dig what I say? How to recreate yourself. You see me? I say, I know say, all who follow me already kind of have a. 
you know, we, we, we put the bits and pieces together and share knowledge. See me? Recreate yourself. As I say, so we could hear one I could shall say. All these a common phrase by that us. suggests a better future and a better you is recreating yourself. But how many really understand how deep it goes? How many people really start on this life-changing journey? We are on the edge of the year 2024, so it's time for a deep waking. A comprehensive guide to recreating yourself in 2024 is provided here. The Stoic philosophy, as well as that of other interesting philosophers, is used in this video. Imagine a life where other people's opinions don't affect you and the noise of society doesn't matter. Whoa. The art of not caring is what we'll talk about first. It's not about boredom, it's about freedom, where you become the center of your own world and don't care about what's going on around you. In this world, people don't try to be happy. It's just there, ready to be realized. But if you really don't care about what's outside, you have to look inside. The art of selfishness is discussed here. Before you get angry at the word selfish, think about this. Can you really love other people if you haven't loved yourself? Learn why selfishness and self-love are the basis of a good life. Now that you have a stronger sense of who you are, let's talk about one of the deepest human quests. Like finding your own sense of purpose in a world full of chaos. Like An anchoring human. purpose can I'm help you see the way. Real. It's not about That's finding myself. meaning, it's about making it, making a life so full that every breath is a reflection of who you are. The last part of our trip is Stoicism, an old philosophy that is still very useful today. Learn about the Stoics' idea of the good life, which is defined by virtue, wisdom, and tranquility, rather than by financial success. A life in which adversity changes you, rather than breaking you. As you start a new year, remember that exercise isn't about changing how you look, but about changing who you... Changing who you are at your heart. It's about finding the gems that are hidden inside you, getting back in touch with your true self, and then sending that energy out into the world. The year 2024 is coming up, and it looks like a clean start. The real question is not whether you should change, but whether you are ready to meet your best self. Don't be afraid to jump in. Let's go on a trip together to reach unmatched growth, wisdom, and enlightenment. Have you ever felt like society's demands were too much for you to handle, or worry about things you couldn't change? You're not the only one if you said yes. A lot of us spend our whole lives worrying about things that may not be as important as we think they are. But what if there was a way to get out of this stuck state? A way to get through life with less stress and more peace of mind? Today, we're going to learn more about a philosophical approach that could help you live a happier, more fulfilling life. The art of not caring. This approach isn't about ignoring or not caring about other people. It's about putting our care and attention where it matters, on things we can control, and letting go of the rest. This video will take you on a trip through the wisdom of different ideologies and the philosophers who have been here before us and left us clues. This look at different religions and their ideas isn't just for school. It includes the calming philosophy of Buddhism, the energizing philosophy of Stoicism, the existential courage of Søren Kierkegaard, the hedonic calculus of Epicurus, the life-affirming ideas of Taoism, and the individualistic essence of existentialism. We'll also talk about cases and uses from real life. The way these ideas have been used by real people will be discussed, along with how not worrying in the right way can lead to more happiness, less fear, and a more complete life in general. But what do we really mean when we say not caring in a philosophical sense? Not caring doesn't mean being completely detached or not caring at all. It means freeing ourselves from social pressures, fears of the unknown, worries about things we can't control, and stress over what other people will think of us. 
it is better to focus on what we do, how we react, and how we feel instead of worrying about things we can't change. This is called the art of not caring. Understanding our limits and choosing what deserves our attention, hard work, and enthusiasm is what it's all about. It's about learning to be okay with not knowing what will happen and relishing the present moment with joy. You've come to the right place if you've ever felt like the world was weighing on your shoulders, or if you've ever wished you could let go of worries that are holding you back, or if you're just interested in learning about different philosophical views on happiness. We hope that by the end of this trip, you'll have a new understanding of how to handle the ups and downs of life with calmness, peace, and a clear mind. Join us as we show you how to free yourself by learning the art of not caring. Now is the time to go on a philosophical trip to learn more about yourself and how to let go so that you can live a happier, more satisfying life. Before we start this journey, it's important to set the scene by looking into the deep connection between philosophy and happiness. How does philosophy help us define and understand what happiness is? Philosophy is the pursuit of knowledge and the love of wisdom. It looks into basic questions about being, reality, information, values, reason, and most importantly, for our talk today, happiness. Many philosophers from different times and places have tried to answer the question of what happiness is and how to get it. From old Greek philosophers to modern thinkers, the main goal of philosophical study has always been to find the means of happiness. On the surface, the idea of happiness seems easy and applies to everyone. But when you look closer, you find that it has many aspects and is very personal and complicated. What makes us happy is mainly based on our own experiences, our culture and what other people expect of us. But the meaning of happiness grows and changes when we look at it through the big picture of philosophy instead of a particular view. So, how do different intellectual views see happiness? First, let's talk about the Greeks. One of the most important philosophers of all time, Aristotle, thought that happiness was more than just a feeling or a short-lived state of joy. He came up with the idea of eudaimonia, which is often translated as well-being or the good life. Aristotle believed that happiness consisted of living a life of virtue and wisdom, reaching one's full potential and making a positive difference in the world. It wasn't about seeking pleasure. It was about making your inner life full. Epicurus, on the other hand, thought that happiness meant seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Epicurean philosophy, on the other hand, doesn't support selfish excess. Epicurus stressed the easy, natural joys of life, such as peace of mind, friendship, and intellectual activities. These philosophers, like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, were utilitarian. They lived in the 17th and 18th centuries, during the Age of Enlightenment. They said that happiness is about making as many people as possible happy. This idea formed the base of their moral and ethical standards. Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher who lived in the 1800s, had a less positive view. He thought that life was full of pain and that happiness was just not having to go through pain. Schopenhauer's philosophy says that we should lessen our wants in order to feel less pain and sadness. This changes the way we think about what happiness is. Then there were the existentialists of the 20th century, such as Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. They thought that life has no meaning by itself, and that it's up to each person to find their own happiness and purpose. They didn't agree with social rules and pushed for sincerity and personal freedom. Also, we can't forget Eastern philosophy practices like Buddhism. Buddhism says that the way to happiness is to let go of desire and attachment, which leads to inner peace and enlightenment. These different philosophical points of view make it clear that happiness isn't an idea that works for everyone. That which we believe, the decisions we make, 
and how we see the world are all deeply connected to it. To be happy, people follow different beliefs. Some seek virtue, others pleasure, still others freedom, or still others spiritual growth. We will look at how letting go of some worries fits in with these different philosophical views on happiness as we talk about the art of not caring today. The goal is to find a balanced and careful way to care about the things that matter to us, which will lead us to a happy and satisfying life. We're happy and satisfying. When you hear the minds of the other mites and the minds of the kings and emperors debating on the laws of happiness, it empowers you. The government says, Kababla and already create pain, everything, pain and confusion, you know what I mean, in the earth. That's why you have to look within and not outside of you. The government says, So, when we hear, what they might, we hear the, the laws of happiness, how other people see it. You see, I say, so we learn from each other. Life. It's important to remember that philosophy doesn't give us solutions. It helps us figure out what questions to ask. As we learn more about how to not care, let's keep an open mind, question what we think we know, and let these different philosophical ideas help us understand what happiness is. Let's set out on this fascinating journey, learning from the deep insights into happiness of great philosophers. Now, let's talk about Stoicism and old Greek philosophy, which has become famous again recently because it has deep wisdom and useful advice for living a good life. Zeno of Sidium started Stoicism in Athens in the early 3rd century BC. However, it was the later Stoic philosophers, such as Epicurus, Seneca, and Marcus Aelius, whose ideas have stood the test of time and still speak to us today. Self-discipline, virtue, and reason well, are important in the ethical philosophy of Stoicism. It shows us that we can't change what happens to us, but we can change how we react to it. It's Stoicism right. tells us to focus on what we can control and let go of what we can't. It's a strong way to learn how to not care. This leads us to the Stoic idea of the two kinds of power. Epicurus, a scholar who used to be a slave, wrote beautifully about this idea in his Enchiridion, or Guide. He said, Some things are within our power, while others are not within our power. Our opinion, motivation, desire, aversion, and, in a word, whatever is of our own doing, are within our power. Not within our power are our body, our property, reputation, office, and, in a word, whatever is not of our own doing. This strong contrast tells us to focus our attention, energy, and feelings on the parts of our lives that we can manage and to act like we don't care about the rest. This doesn't mean we should be lazy or ignore our tasks. Instead, it means we should figure out what's really important and deserves our attention and care. It's about deciding not to be upset by the things we can't change in life. This helps us keep our peace of mind and align ourselves with the natural order of the world, which is a central Stoic idea. Stoicism's example of the skill of not caring can be seen in Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. As Roman Emperor, Marcus Aurelius had a lot of power and influence, but his works show that he knew that these things are temporary. As he put it in writing, very little is needed to make a happy life, it is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. He often stressed the value of inner peace and tranquility over external accomplishments or praise, showing the stoic way of not caring about things we can't change. Sure. In his writings, Seneca, another important stoic writer, gives more examples of this idea. He taught us not to be overly affected by adversity or overly ecstatic about success, and to stay unaffected by external circumstances. In a message he wrote, True happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future, not to amuse ourselves with either hopes or fears, but to rest satisfied with what we have, which is sufficient, for he that is so wants nothing. 
By following Stoic principles, we learn not to worry about how our lives are changing all the time and instead focus on improving our character, wisdom and virtue. We learn to be happy with what we have, not caring about what other people do and at peace with the world. Not caring about anything in the Stoic sense is not the same thing as being indifferent to it. Instead, it means knowing where to focus our care and attention for a happy and peaceful life. From the Stoic school of thought, we now go to Epicurus's garden. Epicurus, a Greek philosopher from antiquity who established the Epicureanism school of philosophy, has another viewpoint on the art of not caring. Despite what many people think, Epicureanism is not about enjoying physical joys or living a fancy life. It's about living a life of tranquility, freedom and friendship, not about knowing the nature of pleasure and desire. Epicurus said that joy is the best thing in the world and the point of life, but he also said that not all pleasures are worth seeking. He made a distinction between kinetic pleasures, which come from gratifying a desire, and catastatic pleasures, which come from a state of contentment when we are not experiencing pain or desires. Epicurus said that the best life is one in which we can stay in a state of catastatic happiness and enjoy the simple things in life without being pushed by desires all the time. What Epicureanism says about social standards and material wants is an important part of the art of not caring. Epicurus wanted people to live a simple life away from the busy life of Athens. He thought that a lot of our wants, like wanting money, fame or power, come from what other people expect of us and aren't normal or important. Epicurus said that these wants often cause more harm than good because they are never-ending and keep us wanting more. Epicurus famously said, If you want to make a man happy, don't add to his riches, take away from his desires. Epicurus's ideas about fear, especially the fear of death, are also very interesting. He said death doesn't matter to us because death doesn't exist when we don't and we don't exist when death does. Epicurus says that we shouldn't be afraid of death because it's a necessary part of life. This way, we can live more freely and happily in the present. So how do these ideas make your life better? We can achieve a state of contentment and inner peace by knowing the nature of our desires, telling them apart from those that aren't important and learning how to control them well. By choosing not to care about what other people think or the fear of death, we free ourselves from worries and stresses that aren't necessary. This makes room for real joy and tranquility. Epicureanism teaches us that happiness doesn't come from having things or being important, but from being at peace inside without any pain or trouble. The philosophy teaches us to enjoy the easy things in life, like friendship, thought, and not having to worry about what other people want or fear. It also teaches us how to not care about other people. The Epicurean way of life tells us to rethink our wants and values, to let go of social expectations and pointless fears, and to enjoy life's simple, long-lasting pleasures. Let's keep these ideas from Epicurus with us as we go on our trip. Let's value the part that pleasure and desire play in our lives and stop worrying about things that don't make us happy in the long run. As we continue our philosophical study of the art of not caring, we visit Denmark in the 1800s and meet Søren Kierkegaard, who is generally seen as the founder of existentialism. Unlike the other philosophers we've talked about so far, Kierkegaard lived in a very different time and culture. Kierkegaard's existential philosophy is all about the person, their feelings, their freedom, their choices, and their subjective life. He thought that everyone has their own idea of what is true, and that everyone has to figure out how to live their own life on their own. His works give us a deep look into the mind of a person by exploring worry, hopelessness, and the search for meaning. The leap of faith in the face of life's riddles and unknowns 
is one of Kierkegaard's most well-known ideas. In order to find purpose and get over depression, according to Kierkegaard, one must take a leap of faith into religion. While the phrase leap of faith is often used in religious contexts, especially in Kierkegaard's works, the idea behind it goes beyond religion. It's about embracing ambiguity and having the guts to make choices without knowing exactly how things will turn out. Fear and worry that we feel every day come from not knowing what will happen. We worry about what might happen in the future and find it hard to make choices when we can't see what will happen. What if, though, we decide not to care about this chance? What if we take that leap of faith, know that we don't know what will happen, and make our decisions with guts and conviction? Kierkegaard said, Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. This quote fits with what we're talking about because it reminds us that we can learn from our mistakes and gain wisdom from them, but we can't know or control what will happen in the future. So, deciding not to worry about what might happen in the future doesn't mean you're careless or don't care what happens. Instead, it's about getting rid of our crippling fear of the unknown so that we can fully live in the moment and do what we believe is right. By freeing us from the weight of worry and fear, Kierkegaard's leap of faith could lead us to greater happiness. When we stop worrying too much about what might happen, we can focus on the here and now and do things that are in line with our values. We free ourselves to live an honest life without being constantly worried about what might happen in the future when we do this. Kierkegaard's psychological philosophy makes us think deeply about our own lives, our worries, and our freedom. His idea of the leap of faith gives us a way to deal with the unknowns in life, not by trying to guess or control the future, but by embracing these unknowns with confidence and focusing on who we really are. We should be brave and care less about the things we can't change in life and more about living fully and honestly in the present. From the bussy streets of Denmark in the 1800s, our intellectual journey takes us to ancient India, where Siddhartha Gautama, better known as the Buddha, created Buddhism, a deep philosophy and way to spiritual awakening. Buddhism is a non-theistic religion that has a special view on happiness, pain, detachment, and how to stop worrying about things that are temporary and will not last. Buddhism has a different idea of what happiness is than many Western schools of thought. Buddhism doesn't think of happiness as pleasure or getting what you want. Instead, it sees real happiness as a deep, long-lasting state of well-being and contentment that comes from inner peace and wisdom. This happiness isn't affected by outside factors, and anyone can get it by being aware, acting in an honest way, and knowing how reality works. The Four Noble Truths are very important to Buddhism. They explain what pain is, why it happens, how to stop it, and the way to do that. According to what the Buddha taught, pain comes from tanha, which means a strong desire for something other or more than what is. We want these things because we don't know that reality is really made up of changeable things. Dissatisfaction and not-self lead us to the Buddhist ideals of detachment and non-attachment, which are very important for knowing how to not care from a Buddhist point of view. In Buddhism, detachment doesn't mean ignoring or avoiding life's events. Instead, it means having a deep knowledge of and acceptance of the fact that everything changes. It means letting go of people, things, events, and even ideas, because you know they can change and disappear. Not being attached to things, events, or ideas is the same thing as being detached. It means not having to hold on to them all the time, we can fully experience life as it happens when we practice non-attachment. We can feel joy, sadness, happiness, and pain without being controlled by these fleeting emotions. We learn to really care about life without being tied down by it. We are not rejecting or devaluing things that change or disappear when we don't care about them. 
Instead, we are learning to connect to them in a better way, fully feeling and enjoying them while they last, but not suffering when they change or disappear. When you apply this way of thinking to your life, you can find deep peace and happiness inside. It helps us enjoy the beauty of the seasons without getting caught up in the storm of desire, dislike, or fantasy. It's said that you only lose what you cling to. This simple but profound saying sums up the core of Buddhist detachment and non-attachment. It tells us to let go and stop worrying too much about things that are temporary and hard to understand. By doing this, we remove ourselves from a lot of the pain we cause ourselves and make room for a deeper, longer-lasting kind of happiness. Buddhist teachings, which go deep into the nature of reality and the mind, can help you learn how to not care. We can learn to live a more peaceful, clear, and free life by learning and applying the ideas of detachment and non-attachment. Let us remember the Buddha's wisdom as we continue our search. Remember that everything can change and that if we don't hold on to things that are temporary, we can find inner peace and happiness that lasts. In the end, isn't that what we all want? We are now back in Europe, this time in Germany in the late 1800s, where we meet Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the most important and controversial philosophers of all time. Friedrich Nietzsche gave us a strong way to look at the art of not caring. He was famous for his attacks on traditional morals and his philosophy of life affirmation. Nietzsche's philosophy is based on the idea of life reinforcement, which he thought was the best thing about being human. Nietzsche said that to support life is to accept it as it is, with all of its problems, doubts and conflicts. It involves accepting life with a sense of joy, wonder and imagination, rather than in a passive or resigned manner. It's easy to see how Nietzsche's ideas about social rules and the art of not caring fit in with this philosophy of life affirmation. Nietzsche thought that traditional morals and social rules often keep people from living fully and honestly. He didn't like the idea of group morals which says that good and bad are the same for everyone. Nietzsche thought that not caring about social rules and standard morals wasn't the same as being indifferent or apathetic. He thought that it was about self-overcoming, which is the process of going beyond conditioned behaviors and beliefs to find your own values. When we don't care about what other people think of us, we can start to question, criticize, and finally get rid of these ideas. This lets us write our own moral code and decide for ourselves what is important, useful, and satisfying. This is where the idea of the Übermensch, which is also known as the Overman or Superman, comes up. This idea is Nietzsche's idea of the perfect person, someone who has gotten over themselves, found their values, and accepted life in all its complexity. The Übermensch is the idea that you don't have to care about traditional morality. Instead, you should enjoy life with all of its chaos and confusion and make your own morals. In Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche said, I teach you the Overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? These strong words are a call to action. They make us think question and make things. They tell us that we can get through hard times and become the people we really are. In our quest to learn how to not care, what does Nietzsche's philosophy have to offer? It makes us think about how we relate to social rules and traditional morals. As a result, it tells us not to let these outside standards limit who we are, but to instead set our own values and accept life as it is. Let's keep Nietzsche's strong ideas in mind as we continue our research. Let's work on getting over ourselves, be brave enough to make our own standards, and learn to accept life as it is. We've dug deeply into the theoretical realms of the art of not caring as we've traveled through the rich fabric of philosophy, from Stoicism to Buddhism, Nietzsche to Sartre and Camus, etc. Put this academic wisdom into practice now. 
How can these intellectual lessons help us in our everyday lives? In the real world, what steps can we take? The first thing we need to do is figure out what we really care about. Think about the stoic concept of the two types of control. Sort the things in your life that you can control from the things that you can't. The key is to focus on the things we can change, like our thoughts, feelings and deeds, and learn to let go of the things we can't. You can feel a lot less stress and worry by doing this simple thing. This will make room for more joy, freedom, and satisfaction. The second thing we want to talk about is embracing doubt. Life is full of doubts, as Kierkegaard taught us, and trying to control or predict everything is not only pointless, but it can also lead to contentment. We can get rid of the fear and worry that come with the unknown by embracing uncertainty and taking that leap of faith. It becomes clear to us that doubt is a chance for growth and change. In the third step, you have to face social standards. We learned from Epicurus, Nietzsche, and existentialism that social rules and standards can make it hard to be ourselves and be happy. Think about the stresses in your own life. Do they match your values and goals, or do they make you feel like you can't be yourself? Not caring about these social standards doesn't mean you're ignoring your duties or not caring about anything. Instead, it's about getting back your freedom to choose your own path, set your own ideals, and make your own character. The fourth step tells us to accept that life is silly. We can recognize the underlying folly and accept it by drawing on Camus's wisdom. Instead of looking for meaning or approval from other people, focus on making your own meaning. This could happen through your hobbies, your job, your relationships, or your own growth. Find joy in the journey, in your Sisyphean battle. Our journey can be helped by these steps, but following them isn't always easy. It takes patience, courage, and self-compassion to go on this journey for a lifetime. Moments of uncertainty, fear, or misunderstanding may occur. Don't forget that it's okay to feel these things. They're normal for people. You should not fight them. Instead, you should recognize them, learn from them, and let them lead you. Now you might be thinking what I can do right now to use these ideas. Mindfulness can help you a lot on this path. To be mindful, you have to be fully present and pay attention to the present moment without judging it. It lets us see our feelings, thoughts, and sensations for what they are without getting caught up in them. Take a few moments every day to sit in silence as a simple relaxation method. Pay attention to your breath and how it feels as air comes in and out of your body. Bring your mind back to your breath slowly if it wanders. You can develop a sense of present, acceptance, and non-attachment through this practice. These are all important skills for learning how to not care. Remember that not caring does not mean not caring about or neglecting. It's about figuring out what's important. You can be a business owner and be an entrepreneur and just make it happen. Neglecting. It's about figuring out what's important, embracing life's uncertainties and nonsense, and finding your own spirit despite what other people think you should be doing. We need to be brave, kind to ourselves, and ready to accept the whole of what it means to be human on this trip, not the end goal. Now that this look at the art of not caring is over, let's take a moment to think and maybe set the stage for what comes next. We've been on an interesting trip through time, from the stoic masters of ancient Rome to the existentialist thinkers of the 20th century, looking at how these philosophical schools have thought about the idea of not caring. We've looked at the stoic principle of the split of control, and we've learned that the key to tranquility and happiness lies in figuring out what we can control from what we can't, and putting our attention and energy there. We learned a lot about Epicurean philosophy by looking at what Epicurus said about happiness, desire, and how important it is to not care about what other people think. We put a lot of faith in Kierkegaard, 
embracing the inevitable uncertainties of life and realizing that not caring about some results can make us happier people. We learned a lot about Eastern philosophy and how the Buddhist ideas of separation and non-attachment can help us let go of things that don't last, which can lead to peace and happiness inside. Pushed us to question social norms and taught us through his philosophy about valuing life, how important it is to not care about following these norms on our way to overcoming ourselves. Sartre and Camus, in particular, were existentialist philosophers who stressed how silly life is and told us to take responsibility for our own lives, saying that not thinking about how silly life is can lead to personal freedom. In the last part, we talked about how to use these intellectual ideas in everyday life. We talked about how to figure out what's important to us, how to deal with confusion, how to go against what society expects of us, and how to accept the ridiculousness of life. We also talked about some problems that might come up along the way, and a simple awareness method that can help you become more present, accepting, and non-attached. However, this discovery is just the start of your trip. The skill of not caring is not a place you can get to, but a way of life that you can follow. It takes self-compassion, patience, and bravery. Remember to apply these philosophical ideas to your own life as you continue to learn more. Figure out what means most to you and let go of what doesn't serve your greatest good. The most important things in life are the lessons we learn, the new ideas we have, and the people we meet. So, go out and learn how to not care about things in your life. See what changes it makes, what freedom it gives you, and what happiness it brings you. Be aware that the path to not caring is not about becoming apathetic or careless. It's about embracing who you are, recovering your freedom, and making your own way. It's about finding your own soul in the midst of societal standards, uncertainty, and the fact that life is just plain silly. At some point, have you ever felt bad about taking the day off, eating your favorite food, or taking a little extra time to care for yourself? Or maybe people have told you you're selfish for putting your own needs first. Now it's time to talk about these feelings and look into the interesting place where self-love and what some might call selfishness meet. We'll take a deep look into the thoughts of some of the most important philosophers and psychologists of all time in this video. These are thinkers who have been brave enough to question the status quo and shed new light on how self-love and selfishness affect our lives. Friedrich Nietzsche, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, Aristotle, Ayn Rand, Jean-Paul Sartre, Buddha, and Eric Erikson all had ideas that changed the world. We will find the secret wisdom in what they taught and use what we learn to improve our own lives. Self-love and selfishness are always being sent mixed messages by the world around us. One, the one hand, we're told to be kind and selfless, to put others before ourselves. Though, we are told it's okay to love ourselves and that our own wants should come first. When we get these mixed messages, we might feel lost and guilty, not sure how to find the right balance. You can use what we're talking about today in your personal and business life because of this. To live happier, more peaceful lives. I've told every single one of my family and friends to sign up for this new 2024 no-cost dental program. I signed up for it last month, not knowing if it was going to work for me, but was super happy when it did because I have needed to get dental work done for the longest time, but have been prioritizing everyday needs like gas and groceries for my family instead of getting the dental work I needed. Now, because of this program, you can get implants, crowns, x-rays, cleanings, and more for no cost out of pocket. As long as you're under 65 and an American citizen, you can apply for it right now. This is the largest dental health benefit ever introduced in this country and was just approved for 2024, but you have to sign up now to be eligible. Click the link below to claim it now. Lives. We need to learn more about self-love and selfishness. We can learn to enjoy ourselves with all of our flaws and strengths 
by setting limits and making time for ourselves. We don't have to feel bad about doing this or worry about being seen as selfish. I used to have a hard time with these very ideas. I would sometimes skip rest, fun, and even health just to keep from being seen as selfish. I would do anything to help other people, even if it meant putting my own health at risk. I didn't understand how important self-love and a certain kind of selfishness are until I started studying philosophy and psychology. These lessons not only changed my personal life, but they also had a big effect on my work life, making me happier and more successful. Therefore, I think this series has something useful to offer you, whether you're here out of interest, in search of personal growth, or to learn things that will help you succeed at work. We'll work together to dispel common myths, see things from different angles, and start a trip to learn more about ourselves and our place in the world. Self-love is more than just going to the spa or eating out at a nice restaurant, though those things can be a part of it. In fact, self-love is a much deeper and more meaningful idea. It's about accepting ourselves fully, flaws and all. It's about recognizing our own worth and being kind and respectful to ourselves. Self-love isn't about being perfect. It's about being okay with how you are. It's about realizing that we're not perfect and that it's okay to mess up. It means showing ourselves the same kindness, understanding and patience that we show to other people. It's not vain or cocky to love yourself. It means recognizing our humanity, our unique mix of strengths and flaws, and appreciating ourselves just the way we are. You can love yourself by taking care of your physical, social and mental health. It's about setting limits, taking care of ourselves, following our hobbies, and putting our needs first. It's about taking care of our bodies, keeping our heads active, and keeping our souls healthy. It has nothing to do with selfishness, right? The word selfishness usually has a bad meaning, which gets us to our next word. Most of the time, it's used to describe someone who puts their own needs ahead of others even if it means hurting them or ignoring their needs. But there is more than one side to this story, as there are to many ideas. When we talk about selfishness in this situation, we're not talking about this harmful, careless behavior. To be more specific, we're talking about a better, healthy kind of selfishness in which we make choices that are good for our own well-being, even if they don't always go along with what other people want. This is the kind of selfishness that lets us say no when we're too busy, follow our dreams, even if they go against social rules, and put ourselves first, even if it seems like a luxury. It's a form of selfishness where we recognize that our own wants are just as important as those of others. Some people think that self-love and selfishness have a confusing relationship, but they really do. So. We have to be a little selfish if we want to really love ourselves. We have to be ready to put our own needs first, set limits, and make decisions that are good for our health. And in order to be positively greedy, we must first see how valuable we are, which means we must love ourselves. Self-love and a good amount of selfishness are like two sides of the same coin. They are both important for our personal growth and happiness. We are able to handle life with resilience, assurance, and inner peace because of the dynamic interaction between self-love and selfishness. But how did these kinds of ideas come about? Where do they fit in the big picture of philosophy and psychological thought? How have they changed over time? As we watch this video, we'll look into these and other questions looking at them from the interesting points of view of different philosophers and psychologists and finding the deep insights they offer. Remember that this is not meant to promote selfishness in the bad sense, where people don't care about others and hurt them. We want to show you how to have a healthy, balanced sense of self, where you can stand up for your needs, know how valuable you are, and still care about and respect the people around you. We are now going to talk about self-love and healthy selfishness in more detail. 
These are two ideas that are deeply connected and play key roles in our mental health, personal growth, and general well-being. To understand why loving yourself is so important for mental health, we need to look at biology, psychology, and how people act. There is a direct link between how we see ourselves and our mental health that has been known for decades by psychologists and experts. Let's picture gardens in our heads. Now, you would think that a yard full of love, happiness, and care would grow well. Similarly, our brains can grow when they are filled with self-love. The thorns of self-doubt, self-criticism, and negative self-talk can poison our mental soil and cause anxiety, sadness, and other mental health problems. Self-love is like a natural defense against these things. When we love ourselves, we give our feelings and situations value. We let ourselves feel what we need to, and that our feelings are important. This kind of support can stop people from repressing their emotions, which is often a sign of mental discomfort. Self-love gives us the courage to deal with life's problems head on. We don't have to break down when things get tough or stress us out. Instead, we can stand tall, knowing that we can and should get through these problems. Having this kind of resilience is important for keeping your mental health in good shape and dealing with the ups and downs of life. What does good selfishness have to do with this, though? If self-love is the dirt that our mental garden grows in, then healthy selfishness is the act of taking care of that garden and making sure it gets the food it needs. Healthy selfishness entails recognizing our wants and taking action to satisfy them. Despite our busy lives, it's about making time for ourselves, putting our health first, and not being afraid to set limits. By putting our needs first, we can learn more about ourselves, improve our skills, and follow our hobbies, which leads to personal growth. A good sense of selfishness also helps us learn how to say no, stop trying to please others, and stop taking on too much. A lot of us fall into these traps, and it hurts our mental and emotional health. A crucial step in personal growth is learning to say no to things that drain us. This is an act of healthy selfishness. Self-love and healthy selfishness work together to make a powerful force that helps us live a peaceful, happy, and full life. They help us stay mentally balanced, develop as people, and face the challenges of life with confidence and resilience. We create a mental garden in our minds by loving ourselves, which is a healthy environment for good ideas, self-worth, and resilience. Our healthy selfishness helps us take care of this garden and give it the food, attention, and care it needs to grow. Together, these ideas help us live a life where we can stand tall, not swayed by the winds of outside support or validation, but firmly grounded in self-love and respect. Finally, we can find a balance where we can meet our own wants while also caring about those of others. We'll keep digging deeper into these ideas to find the wisdom they hold as we go. We will learn not only academic knowledge, but also practical, applicable wisdom that can change our lives, guided by the deep insights of philosophers and psychologists who have illuminated the way to self-love and healthy selfishness in their lessons. Let's go down... Get more views, more money, and grow your following by posting your long content to TikTok. If you're an eligible creator, join TikTok's new one minute plus growth program. For tons of incentives, just add TikTok today. Down this path with an open mind and a desire to learn. Carl Rogers, a famous and important psychologist who is known as one of the founders of humanistic psychology, is our first stop. Roger's ideas will always be remembered in this area. Let's go inside his head and find out how he feels about loving yourself. Carl Rogers was a leader in his field. He was born in 1902. His focus on the individual human experience and self-actualization changed the way people thought about these things 
and went against the popular psychoanalysis and behaviorist views of the time. Roger's method was person-centered, emphasizing each person's inherent goodness and growth potential. His work has a long impact on psychology, counseling, and psychotherapy because it is full of kindness and understanding. Rogers thought that people needed to feel unconditional positive regard in order to reach a state of self-actualization, which is the best level of psychological growth and the point at which a person realizes their full potential. Rogers came up with this phrase to describe fully accepting and loving oneself no matter what or who you are. That's what self-love looks like. The most important thing in Roger's humanistic psychology is pure love. Roger stressed that self-love shouldn't depend on results, support from others, or following social rules. It shouldn't depend on what you've done. Therefore, he pushed for self-love that isn't affected by these outside factors and is based on knowing and accepting one's own unique innate worth. Rogers says that loving yourself is not a sign of ego or pride. It's not about thinking you're better than other people. Instead, it's about recognizing your worth, being open to your own experiences, and believing what you think and feel. Rogers thought that this kind of self-love is essential for personal growth and reaching one's full potential. When we love ourselves no matter what, we make it safe to explore and learn about ourselves. We let mistakes happen and learn from them, which promotes growth personally. We also develop an internal locus of evaluation, which means we trust our own decisions and don't just look to other people's ideas to back them up. According to Roger, embracing our capacity for change and growth is another aspect of self-love. It has to do with realizing that we are not fixed things, but are always changing. In this sense, self-love entails embracing both the person we are right now and the person we can grow into. Additionally, Roger's therapy was based on the idea that a therapist's job was to create an atmosphere of sincerity, understanding, and unconditional positive respect in order to help their clients develop self-love and growth. He said that people automatically move toward better self-understanding, self-acceptance, and self-actualization when they are in such a setting. That shows Roger's faith in the healing power of loving yourself. Roger's view on self-love not only changed the way therapy is done, but it also has a lot to do with what we're talking about. His ideas give us a new way of looking at things. They encourage us to love ourselves no matter what, and they show us that doing so can lead to personal growth and self-realization. Now we'll look at the work of Abraham Maslow, who was one of the first psychologists to use humanistic methods. As with Carl Rogers, Maslow's ideas about the order of needs and self-actualization give us a convincing way to look at our conversation. The famous American psychologist Abraham Maslow was born in 1908 and made a big difference in the field with his humanistic method. This view, which is sometimes called the third force in psychology, stresses how good people are by nature and how important it is for them to grow psychologically in a healthy way. Maslow is probably best known for his theory of the hierarchy of needs, which is still used today in business, marketing, psychology, and even education. Maslow put the idea of self-actualization at the top of his hierarchy of needs because it was the most important thing to him. Maslow said that self-actualization is the process of reaching your full potential over time. This idea, which is all about personal growth and improvement, is linked to what we talked about when we talked about self-love and healthy selfishness. At the base of Maslow's ladder of needs are basic needs like food and water. At the top are self-actualization needs. Maslow says that people must first meet their basic wants in order to go after their more important ones. In other words, someone must first meet their needs for safety, love and connection and respect 
before they can try to become their best selves. Self-love and selfishness can be seen in a very interesting way through this idea. In the framework of Maslow's structure, loving yourself is an important part of meeting since 1882, Galbani cheesemakers have been the mozzarella experts. So no matter how you slice it, stack it, or snack it, you get a taste of Dolce Vita. Try Galbani, Italy's number one cheese brand. In all of these needs, the more we love ourselves, the more we take care of our wants, from the physical to the mental. Self-care, which could be seen as a good form of selfishness, is an important step on the path to becoming your best self. Maslow also talked about how important self-esteem was in the order. He did this to show how self-love and respect are for personal growth. It was his idea that people need to respect themselves and others in order to move up the system. Self-love is very important because it's what makes self-esteem and self-respect possible. In addition, the search for self-actualization can be seen as a good form of selfishness. Maslow says that seeking personal growth, satisfaction, and peak moments is a part of self-actualization. It's about getting better at being yourself. Some might say that this is a form of selfishness, but it is a good and healthy thing to do because it leads to personal growth and happiness. Maslow's theory acknowledges the significance of a certain amount of selfishness in living a happy life by focusing on personal growth and the satisfaction of one's own needs. It's important to remember, though, that Maslow also thought of transcendence as part of self-actualization. This meant helping others and seeing how you are connected to the rest of humanity. Abraham Maslow's ideas give us a new and interesting way to look at self-love and healthy selfishness. His writing reveals the road to self-actualization, emphasizing the importance of healthy selfishness in our personal growth, as well as the role of self-love in meeting our needs. Going back in time to learn about ancient wisdom, we now look at Aristotle, one of the most important philosophers in history. His wide-ranging work, which includes philosophy, ethics, and politics, has influenced thought for hundreds of years and can still teach us a lot about self-love and healthy selfishness. Aristotle was born in 384 BC. He studied under Plato and then taught Alexander the Great. He opened a school in Athens called the Lyceum and taught there for more than 10 years. His work had a huge impact on philosophy in the West and laid the groundwork for many later philosophical ideas and ways of doing things. The idea of eudaimonia, which is often translated as happiness or flourishing, is at the heart of Aristotle's ethical philosophy. Aristotle said that eudaimonia is the most important thing in life and in thought. It is, however, a permanent state of being that comes from living a life of virtue and realizing one's full potential rather than a fleeting state of happiness or pleasure. The ideas of self-love and reasonable self-interest are deeply linked to the idea of eudaimonia. Aristotle said that loving oneself is not only okay, it's important for eudaimonia. He thought that self-love wasn't about being selfish, but about wanting and working toward what is good for yourself. Aristotle's idea of reasonable self-interest is related to his idea of self-love. He said that we are logical humans who want to reach our fullest potential by nature. So, to truly love ourselves, we need to seek virtue and wisdom and basically become the best versions of ourselves. It's a type of good selfishness where one looks for personal growth and satisfaction without hurting other people, but rather as a way to make a difference in society. Let's look at some real-world examples to help you understand how Aristotle's ideas can be used. Like, let's say you're an artist. In the Aristotelian sense, loving yourself would mean putting all of your efforts into getting better at what you do, finding and using your own unique artistic style and reaching your fullest potential. You can make a difference in the world in your own unique way by recognizing your interest and ability. 
Or think about a situation where you have to choose between a high paying job that doesn't bring you joy and a lower paying job that does. According to Aristotle's philosophy, loving oneself entails taking the road that makes you truly happy and helps you reach your full potential, even if it seems harder or less rewarding at the time. To sum up Aristotle's idea of eudaimonia, these examples show what it means to live a happy life by seeking virtue and personal excellence. Self-love and a certain amount of selfishness are not only good, they are necessary in this situation. In turn, they push us to improve ourselves and reach our full potential, which leads to our personal growth and in turn, the improvement of our communities. Aristotle's wisdom opens up a new way to think about self-love and healthy selfishness. It supports the idea that these ideas are not at odds with each other, but work together to make a happy life. His philosophy encourages us to consider our abilities, our interests, and the decisions we make, emphasizing the significance of loving ourselves well and acting in our own best interests. The next stop on our trip is Ayn Rand, a controversial but important figure in both writing and philosophy. Born in Russia in 1905, Rand moved to the United States in the 1920s. It was there that she came up with the thought system called objectivism, which can be found in her books like The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Rand's philosophy supports a level of ethical egoism that she called the virtue of selfishness. This gives us a unique way to look at self-love and healthy selfishness. Objectivism, Ayn Rand's philosophy, says that the most important thing in life is to be happy. She pushed for a kind of logical selfishness in which each person's own life and happiness are their most important goals. Objectivism says that everyone has a moral duty to look out for themselves, not help others, and protect their own rights. In her book, The Virtue of Selfishness, Rand says that her idea of selfishness is not not caring about other people, but not being willing to give up something for them. It's important to note that Rand's idea of reasonable selfishness doesn't support hurting or taking advantage of other people. It's about being true to yourself, sticking to your goals and beliefs, and living in a way that makes you happy in the end. Rand argued, an award-winning trading app that is as easy to set up as your favorite playlist. Voted most popular broker 2022 by TradingView Awards. Open an account at www.owanda.com. Leverage trading is high risk, losses can exceed deposits. Argued that one must use reason to decide one's own interests, avoiding the trap of instant satisfaction or short-term benefits at the price of long-term well-being. Let's break down Rand's idea of reasonable selfishness to get a better sense of her point of view. The word rational is very important here. Rand's selfishness isn't about giving in to whims or short-term wants. It's about acting in a way that benefits herself in the long run. Rand says that someone who is truly selfish would never hurt others, lie, or steal because it would not make sense for them to do those things. It breaks down trust, hurts relationships, and makes life difficult in the long run. A strong sense of self-respect and self-esteem are also central to Rand's definition of selfishness. Aristotle talked about self-love in a similar way that Rand does. Rand's selfishness is about loving oneself, staying true to one's ideals, and seeking personal growth and satisfaction. Indeed, Rand says that this kind of logical selfishness is necessary for a society to be fair. Everyone should look out for their own best interests and accept the rights of others to do the same. This will create a society where people work together and value each other. Rand said that a world where everyone exhibits logical selfishness is one where people are free, happy and respectful of each other's rights. As we talk about self-love and healthy selfishness, Ayn Rand gives us a thought-provoking point of view. Her support for sensible selfishness goes against common sense 
and makes us think again about what selfishness means to us and how it affects our lives. It's a stark reminder of how important it is to live our lives in line with our ideals and our own best interests and to understand the fundamental role this plays in our general health and happiness. There's no denying the importance of recognizing and embracing our own self-interest, even if some people think her philosophy is too extreme or just a cold-hearted support of egocentrism. We not only find personal happiness by doing this, but we also help make society more honest, open, and, in the end, peaceful. Our intellectual journey now takes us to the peaceful world of Stoicism, where we meet Epictetus, a famous thinker from this school of thought. Even though he had a hard childhood and was born a slave in Phrygia around 55 AD, Epictetus went on to become one of the most important Stoic philosophers. His lessons have been useful for hundreds of years and are still useful today. The philosophy of Stoicism says that virtue, wisdom and morals are the best ways to be happy. We may not be able to change what happens to us, but we can change how we react to it. The Stoic philosophy says that we should be calm and accept our fate and circumstances while focused on getting better through reason, self-discipline and virtue. Epictetus is a well-known Stoic philosopher who is best known for his ideas about inner freedom and self-control. Some of his most important books, like Discourses and Enchiridion, go into great detail about these ideas. Epictetus says we need to know the difference between what we can control, like our thoughts, feelings and actions, and what we can't, like outside events, other people's actions, or their views. This knowledge is what his philosophy and Stoic thought in general are built on. Self-control in the Epicurean sense is more than just staying away from temptations and acting on impulse. Instead, it's about being able to control how we feel and respond to things happening around us. It means realizing that our inner state or happiness is not determined by what happens to us but by how we answer it. This point of view is very much in line with self-love because it tells us to take care of our mental and emotional health and keep our inner peace. Stoicism places a high value on taking care of oneself, emphasizing the importance of maintaining tranquility, emotional resilience, and moral honesty. In Stoicism, Self-care isn't just about treating yourself or relaxing physically, despite what most people think. It means keeping your mind, body and soul in balance by doing things like meditating, reflecting and taking care of your health. It also means developing our reason, controlling our feelings and increasing our virtue, all of which are connected to loving yourself and acting in your own best interests. The ideas of self-love and reasonable self-interest are profoundly echoed in the lessons of Epictetus and Stoic philosophy. He tells us to put our inner peace first, think clearly, and support moral virtues, all of which are manifestations of self-love and self-interest. The idea of keeping inner freedom and self-control, however, may be where the most important agreement lies. Being self-aware respecting ourselves and taking responsibility for our mental health are all important parts of loving yourself and acting in your own best interests. Putting Epictetus's ideas into practice in our daily lives can have big impacts. Let's say that a project at work is making you feel worried. Use Epictetus's advice to figure out what you can control instead of letting your worry take over. You can't change how the job turns out, but you can change how hard you work on it, how you use your time, and how you deal with stress. Or, if you're having a hard time with your self-esteem, it can help to think about what Epictetus said about inner freedom. Figure out that your morals, deeds, and inner peace are what make you valuable. Your fate is mine.
demands a guardian. other people think or what happens. Our next guide is Jean-Paul Sartre, a French philosopher and one of the most important figures in existential philosophy. He will help us find our way through the complicated maze of self-love and selfishness. Sartre was born in Paris in 1905 and wrote and thought a lot. His ideas have had a big impact on Western philosophy especially existentialism and phenomenology. Existentialism, the philosophical movement that Sartre helped spread, is based on the idea that each person has a unique experience in a world that is either not caring about them or even unfriendly to them. People in this school of thought value freedom, choice and responsibility. Existentialists say that each person is free to decide what their life is all about. This freedom is both freeing and challenging because it comes with the duty of choice. The popular idea in Sartre's philosophy is that existence precedes essence, which means that as people, we exist first, and then it is up to each of us to shape our essence or nature. Sartre's idea of sincerity is based on this freedom from the inside out. Living in a way that is true to you, regardless of what other people think or expect of you. Accepting this psychological freedom and taking full responsibility for our actions, decisions and the results that follow is what Sartre meant by authenticity. You have to realize that you are in charge of your own life and can't put the blame on other people or outside events. In Sartre's own words, man is condemned to be free because he is responsible for everything he does once he is out in the world. Authenticity, self-love and selfishness all have interesting things in common. Sartre's idea of authenticity is linked to self-love and healthy selfishness because it tells us to be true to ourselves and put our beliefs and values first. Recognizing our wants, taking responsibility for our decisions and living in line with who we really are, are all necessary steps. This is about liking yourself enough to live in a way that is true to who you are, even if that means going against what other people think is right. Genuineness, on the other hand, isn't about navel-gazing selfishness for Sartre, it's about freedom and duty. It's not a reason to ignore other people or avoid doing what you need to do. Instead, it's a call to be real with our freedom and the choices it gives us. There is a small but important difference between this and selfishness. Being real means being aware of and acting on our wants, but it doesn't mean stepping on other people to get what we want. Think about your connections with other people to see how Sartre's idea of truthfulness can be used in real life. Being real means telling the truth about your needs and feelings, even if they're different from what your partner, friend, or family wants. It's about being brave enough to be yourself and not giving up your ideals or morals to make other people happy. In a work setting, living authentically might mean picking a job path that makes you happy instead of one that is popular or pays well. Recognizing your interests and goals and taking ownership of the decisions that support them are the key. Sartre's idea of sincerity is an interesting way to look at self-love and healthy selfishness. His philosophical philosophy tells us to enjoy our freedom, take responsibility for our lives, and be brave enough to live honestly. This helps us learn more about self-love and selfishness. Let's keep going on our philosophical trip. This time we'll go east and find safety under the Bodhi tree of Buddhism. From what Siddhartha Gautama, also known as the Buddha, taught in the 6th century BC, this very old philosophy grew. Millions of people around the world have benefited from the Buddha's lessons enduring wisdom and direction. 
The Four Noble Truths are at the heart of Buddha's lessons. They explain what pain is, why it happens, how to stop it, and the way to do it. The Noble Eightfold Path is what the Buddha said you should do to end your pain and reach Nirvana, which is a state of perfect peace and understanding. The Middle Way, which is also called the Noble Eightfold Path, is an important part of what Buddha taught. The Middle Way is a road of balance, somewhere between giving in to your wants and not giving in to your needs. It stays away from both sides and instead encourages a calm and thoughtful way of living. The Buddha found this way after trying both extreme poverty and lavish wealth and learning that neither was the way to true happiness or enlightenment. This is a complete road that includes mental control, wisdom and moral behavior. It includes having the right view, the right intention, the right speech, the right action, the right livelihood, the right... Meet the best Big Mac ever made with more special sauce. I believe you've already met Hamburger. Your best Big Mac ever comes with a free order of medium fries when you order in the McDonald's app. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Right effort, the right mindfulness, and the right concentration. These things, taken together, make up a healthy way of life that helps people be free from pain. When we study the middle way's effects on self-love and selfishness, an interesting interplay becomes clear. Self-love from a Buddhist viewpoint can be seen as a caring care for one's well-being, both physical and mental. It includes encouraging wholesome states of thinking and minimizing unwholesome ones. The practice of self-love fits well with the middle way, as it includes taking care of oneself without falling into the extremes of narcissism or self-neglect. On the other hand, selfishness in Buddhism isn't inherently demonized. Instead, it's the unskillful or harmful expressions of selfishness that are discouraged, such as greed, hatred, and delusion. These are seen as roots of suffering that pull one away from the right path. However, a healthy sense of selfishness, like caring for one's well-being, is important in Buddhism, as it helps cultivate self-love and compassion, which are crucial in walking the middle way. Let's consider the practice of meditation, a fundamental part of Buddhist practice. Meditation can be seen as an act of self-love and healthy selfishness. It's a time you dedicate entirely to yourself, focusing inward and cultivating a tranquil and mindful state of mind. This practice aligns perfectly with the middle way, nurturing balance and avoiding extremes like excessive outward focus or complete detachment. In a real-world context, the middle way can guide us to balance our personal and professional lives, taking care of our needs without neglecting our responsibilities towards others. It can inspire us to live healthily, neither indulging excessively in sensual pleasures nor denying ourselves joy and comfort. It teaches us to approach life with equanimity, understanding and compassion, not just for others, but also for ourselves. The Buddha's middle way provides a compelling perspective on the delicate balance between self-love and selfishness. It encourages us to cultivate self-love and a healthy sense of self-interest without swinging to the extremes of self-indulgence or self-denial. As we delve deeper into our exploration, we turn our gaze to the mid-20th century and the contributions of a German social psychologist, psychoanalyst, sociologist, and humanistic philosopher, Erich Fromm. Born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1900, Fromm's ideas transcended academic fields providing profound insights into human behavior, love, and society. Fromm is best known for his work, The Art of Loving, published in 1956. In this seminal work, he presents love not as a sentiment easily swayed by passion or external factors, but as an art that one must cultivate and nurture. According to Fromm, the practice of love involves a sense of discipline, concentration, patience, and a transcendence of narcissism. 
Most importantly, it requires an ability to love oneself. Fromm's conception of self-love is far from the notion of narcissism or conceitedness. He emphasized that loving oneself and loving others are two sides of the same coin. They're inseparable. To Fromm, self-love means acknowledging one's own worth and not hating oneself for one's shortcomings. It's a deep appreciation for oneself that, in turn, allows for the genuine love of others. Fromm wrote, In the experience of love lies the only answer to being human, lies sanity. He believed that an individual's mental health could not be separated from their capacity to love themselves and others. He argued that self-love and the love for others are intertwined, noting that love isn't possible without self-love, and self-love isn't possible without the love for others. In practical terms, Fromm's idea of of self-love encourages us to maintain a balance between caring for ourselves and for others. It's about acknowledging our own needs and aspirations while respecting and caring for the needs and aspirations of others. It rejects the notion of self-love as a narcissistic, self-absorbed act, redefining it instead as an inclusive act that extends beyond the self. In our relationships, whether personal or professional, Fromm's idea encourages us to practice active listening, understanding, and mutual respect, stemming from the love we cultivate for ourselves and extend to others. It pushes us to be patient, not just with others, but also with ourselves, as we navigate through the challenges of life. In the realm of personal growth and development, Fromm's concept teaches us to embrace our flaws and work on them without hating or being too harsh on ourselves. It encourages a healthy level of self-critique and introspection, fostering personal growth and a better understanding of ourselves. Fromm's perspective on self-love as an integral part of loving others provides a crucial layer to our understanding of self-love and selfishness. His thoughts encourage us to recognize self-love not as an isolated, self-centered act, but as a vital step towards loving others and leading a wholesome life. As we journey through the different philosophies and psychological perspectives on self-love and selfishness, we find ourselves in a mosaic of ideas, each unique yet sharing common threads. Comparing and contrasting these perspectives helps us appreciate their depth and diversity and guides us in integrating these principles into our daily lives. Starting with Carl Rogers, we saw that self-love is intrinsically tied to the concept of self-actualization. A positive view of oneself enables one to explore their potentials and capabilities fully. The concept of self-actualization resurfaces in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, emphasizing self-love as a crucial element in fulfilling our highest potential. Aristotle's eudaimonia echoes similar sentiments with the pursuit of happiness through self-realization and the achievement of personal excellence. On the other hand, Ayn Rand's objectivism introduces the idea of rational selfishness, arguing that pursuing one's self-interest when done rationally is the highest moral purpose. This contrasts with the stoic perspective represented by Epictetus, which advocates for self-control and inner freedom, seeking tranquility and virtue rather than immediate self-gratification. Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialist perspective throws us into the pursuit of authenticity, implying that self-love is about embracing our freedom and taking responsibility for our actions. Meanwhile, Buddha's middle way teaches us to navigate between the extremes of self-denial and self-indulgence, emphasizing the need for a balanced approach to self-love and selfishness. Eric Fromm bridges these different perspectives by presenting self-love as an art crucial for our ability to love others. His work underscores the mutual interdependence between loving oneself and loving others. 
Despite their varied historical and cultural contexts, these philosophers and psychologists share an appreciation for the value of self-love and a balanced sense of selfishness. They all recognize in one way or another that self-love is not an act of vanity or narcissism, but a crucial part of human well-being and a key to a fulfilling life. The concept of selfishness, too, is reframed as a healthy act of caring for oneself and not an expression of disregard for others. In terms of applying these perspectives to contemporary life, we can take away several valuable lessons. Self-love is about recognizing our self-worth and treating ourselves with kindness and respect. It involves understanding and meeting our needs, whether physical, emotional, or psychological. Uh, psychological. Bless the love and light, everyone. You know the reason why I got you them knowledge and them book here. It means I got you with that smile because the cup of knowledge overflowed over the cup of the truth I come out. But we realize that the other minds them are winning it. Every book written by so and so. Well, they have certain theory and certain lifestyle and scientific fact of the activation of one and one, ones and one thought throughout the earth still, you know? Where you can say some Greek. The Greek always align themselves with philosophy. Greek always align themselves with our history. Well, no problem. Don't know, do, because we know the truth. We know the, the, the first light of civilization. Bless up, Lady V. More power still, right? Have a blessed day. Blessed sabbatical light still. You know what I mean? I say? The reason why I study them things you know, is just for us, re, just for confirmation, because certain things we already know already. You know what I mean? I say? Certain things we are do unconsciously and not even know. Because the laws of the universe is real, and anyhow, we learn if you apply them and, and live within the law, everything will be perfect. Just know say, everything when I read, create for serve you. You don't serve things, you know what I mean? You don't slave for money, make money slave for you. Pay yourself 10% out of every dollar where you earn. Put it in a different account and make that money work for you. You understand me? I say, so when all age come, you can live gracefully. You go me? I say, and teach your kids them the same. Like. Um, this is this 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 is um book is about recreating yourself. For recreate yourself is to recreate your way of thinking. You see me? Recreate your way your ways of thinking and see life different. Don't carry no stress. Don't carry no problem. Just. Wake up, you know, in the high frequency. Have a happy smile. Have something to be happy about. Have something to be joyful about. If you know, I'm not if you, if you, if you, if you happy about, happy about life. You know, happy about, see, you wake up and you're in the world. And you know what say in the world? The world where you know, we create it. You see me? You understand the things that of use how we create it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just know everything in the of It's for you. If you want a million dollars, when you're ready for your million dollars, it'll go there in abundance. If you want a billion for your billion, it'll go come save you. I just say, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right, that's all. Yeah. So, I'm going to finish that book here later, you know. Yeah. I'm going to finish that book here later. Yeah, so bless up, yeah? Yeah, I mean, yeah. 500 and pe 516 people passed through. I just saw you go. Um, later we finish this.